Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we're back in 2024, and as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, uh, last week was kind of fun, wasn't it? Oh, it was a blast. Happy had, memories instead of this year. <laughs> we had some interesting feedback on it. Um, one of our listeners emailed us, said it was a great show. Um, he It brought back a lot of memories. One guy on Twitter was very angry with us, saying, Conroy's not playing, you idiots. So we, we had some uh, interesting feedback last week. Well, yeah, and... That was kind of the point, was to, you know, talk about the 04 team. and not, We also had know. one guy who thought that we just re-released an episode from 2004 and said, wow, you like mind readers. How'd you know Connor is going to be the GM in 20 years? <laughs> but we're back in 2024 now, and we have to talk about... Uh, so, uh, so we had some success with our April Fool's joke. We, we actually did. got a couple of people. We, that, we did, but now we got to talk about a, a week of less than stellar hockey. The Flames played three games this, this past week. Um, we won't talk about the ones before the April Fools episode. I don't know if there's really any perfect week to talk about here, but three games, three losses this week. The Anaheim Ducks came to town on April second, on Tuesday, and uh, Kil- Kalorn scored twice in the third. The Ducks to- topped the Flames to end their losing streak at five. This is a five to three Ducks win. You know, even though the score sounds somewhat close, uh, the Flames did not play well at all. No. Um, frankly, uh, the 5-3 result was very much um, benefiting the Flames in terms of on-ice play. Like, the Flames... Like, if Anaheim was a better team, like, this could have been a double-digit game. Yeah. Um, and I'm, you know, at the start of the game, the Flames actually played fairly well. The Ducks, it took them quite a while to get their first shot on net, but like once they actually got going, um, yeah, there you go. I was looking the, for something nice to say, and I think you've got the nice thing to say about the Flames here. Yeah, it well, they did have the lead at one point, uh, then they gave up three goals, <laughs> so uh, yeah, not good. Nope. And even when, you know, even when they had the lead, I mean, they had it and they didn't, I don't think play like they had the lead. No. And like they gave it up pretty much like three minutes later and yeah, the third period started tied and like the flames just sucked for the first five minutes. Uh, There's no other way of sugarcoating it. Like they were just bad and Anaheim capitalized twice. And that was the ball game right then and there. Maybe I guess the good thing to say, Kuzmenko gets two in this one. Like, you know, I think there was a lot of questions when he came in about what kind of player he is, and he struggled a little bit. He seems like he's finally playing back to his form. Well, the thing is, is that, like, the talent is there. You do not score 39 goals in a season without having some idea of how to actually score goals. Um, The thing is, is that uh, he... uh, just got buried because the coach didn't like his lack of defensive game and the flames have a perfect opportunity for him to reestablish his offensive game and he's been playing at a 30 plus goal pace um he actually has more goals with the flames than lindholm has points with the canucks and you know better plus minus even uh than lindholm does and you know it's one of those where it, you know if he can learn some consistency in his game and be able to be more effective on the defensive side. Like he doesn't have to be stellar, but you know, if he can just be okay defensively, then, you know, the flames can benefit from having a legitimate scoring threat to go with Sharon Govich. Yeah. I mean, every team has those guys generally in their top six, those kind of top line guys who, and you know, I mean, even when the flames had, uh, you know, Johnny Goudreau, here's very much this wave. There's really no defense, right? They're all offense. Yeah, like the player that stylistically, in a lot of ways, that he reminds me of uh, the most is uh, Christian Huzelius, Um Where, you know, like he, where Huzelius was very much more of a fancy stick handler, uh, at where Kuzmenko's more of a shot oriented player. Um, they're just very cognizant of where they need to be on the offense to, uh on the ice to generate 
scoring chances. And, you know, their consistency is the, the main problem. And, like, when they're really on, like Kuzmenko has been uh, when he first got here and after he, he got better from the illness he suffered, uh, he's been stellar. And, you know, it, it'll be just interesting to see, uh, especially heading into next season, what type of player he will be for this team. On April 4th, the Calgary Flames played the Winnipeg Jets in Winnipeg. Um, it's been said that the Flames play down to bad opponents and up to good opponents. Winnipeg Jets are a good team. The Flames didn't play up here. They got a another big loss, a 5-2 to two loss in Winnipeg. Their only two Flames goals in this one, interestingly, come from defensemen. First goal from Mackenzie Weger and the second one from Daniil M- Miramanov. Yeah, um, the Flames in the first period basically got their head shoveled in <laughs> uh on the shot clock like it was terrible after one period um like they they were not good they the jets had 17 shots to the flames eight and i felt that after that the flames played a fairly even contest with the jets and were eventually able to tie it in the second period but uh, the difference in this one was the talent level of the two teams, and the Jets just have more depth and more talent, and Gabe Velarde got his first NHL hat trick in the game. Yeah, we had Dustin Wolf and net for this one, and it felt like, like you said, the Flames kind of dug themselves a hole in the first, came back to sort of even in the second, but then couldn't keep their foot on the gas and just let the Jets kind of run away with it again. Yep. And it happens. And, like, I can't really blame Wolf on any of the goals. Like, no. he, he played well enough where, you know, uh, they should have won had, you know, he made 41 saves. Like, there's not really much you can do uh, beyond <laughs> that. So it, it's just the team in front of him is not playing very well. And not much you can do. That's maybe that should be the name of this week's episode. Not much you can do. Um, yeah, the last episode, the last game of the week, one that should be an important game. It's always the Battle of Alberta, one that I guess is the second sellout of the year at the Celdom this year. Calgary took on Edmonton in Edmonton, of course, wearing those uh, Heritage Classic uniforms, or they were supposed to. They didn't in this one. I think this is the first time they haven't worn the Heritage Classic uniforms. Um, but Calgary had Blasty for this one. Um, the big news, and as weird as this is. Zari played center in this game. That's kind of the big news of this one. He's, he played center all through junior. He has played wing since he became a, a pro and now moving back to center. And Sharon Govich gets uh, 30 goals. He's the first flame to 30 this season. Matt, I thought this was probably a solid flames, the most solid flames effort we've probably seen in weeks. They, I would say, controlled all 60 minutes, but got, and, and you know, Edmonton was on a back to back. Like, they shouldn't have been bested by them as easily as they were, but I feel like Edmonton just showed that they're, you know, they're the better team here. Well, yeah, and, you know, the Flames scored two power play goals. The Oilers scored two power play goals. Um, you know, if you take those out, it's a one nothing final with the empty netter on top. And, you know, it, it's one of those, the Flames pretty much dominated the game five on five. Yeah. I thought that they played well enough that they probably should have won this game. They battled back to tie it in the second or in the third period. And then, it, you know, it just, you know, bad penalty resulted in a goal against on the power play. And, you know, that, at least uh, McDavid didn't score his 100th assist against us in this game. He got number 99, though. Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a really good game for sure. Um you know, I think it's probably the best Flames effort I can remember in recent memory for all 60 minutes, not 20, not 40. I think they played 60 minutes, but like you said, just some, just the flow of the game. Um, this was a very classic battle of Alberta, right? There's some rough stuff. There was a lot of chippiness. And I think the the Flames maybe got a little carried away and that's what cost them the game. Yeah. Well, and the Flames are now in the last 14 games are 3 and 11. So it's not like they've been playing very good hockey of late. No, they haven't. Um let's talk about Zari. What did you think of Zari as a centerman? I thought he played okay. I uh, would not mind that experiment continuing um through the balance of the regular season. 
Uh, if he can learn to stick at center, uh, that will benefit this team immensely, uh, especially as, you know, like we're eventually going to have to move on from Kadri and Backlund, even though they'll be here for a couple of years. And frankly, the Flames do not have a center in the organization that can play top nine minutes. So if Zari can play that way, that like that would be an amazing help for this team. Uh, it's just one of those things where, uh, you know, whether it's through the draft or free agency, this team's going to need uh, to find some help. Uh, well, I think they need a center next year. So, like, the draft I don't think is viable for this year. No, I'm um, just meaning, like, over, like, the, the next – several seasons like we're gonna eventually start need some guys coming up at the center position let's come back to this we'll go through the stats and then i want to have a discussion about centerman okay um so yeah not a great result there three losses for the flames this week that puts the flames now after 76 games at 34 wins 37 losses and five overtime losses for a total of 73 total points that puts them sixth in the wild card race, which now they're mathematically eliminated from the playoffs. They were uh, officially as of Tuesday when Winnipeg clinched. Um, but it's interesting here. I mean, if you look, they're at seventy three. Arizona's at seventy one. So uh, you know, Ottawa's at seventy two. Like yeah, you know, seventy two. Like so I mean, there's some movement there. And if the Flames keep playing the way they have, that it's likely they're going to fall down. Anaheim's at 54. You're not going to fall that far. You can't fall that far. I mean, there's too big of a gap, but we've got Anaheim at 54, Chicago at 51, St. Louis at 44 in the West. Um, or sorry, uh, San, San Jose. Jose at 44 yeah. in the West. So, you know, I mean, you could fall into the top five potentially. Yeah, and realistically, you know, this team needs a Sean Monahan or a Matthew Kachuk type guy. Um in the draft and you know you're unless you're picking in the top two uh and get lucky with the draft lottery you're not going to be getting one of those guys if you're picking eighth ninth tenth yeah. uh, you know and it with how ginla has been playing in the playoffs his ranking is going to go up <laughs> i think uh as they head to the draft uh so, you know, and he's looking like he's going to be more of we'll like We'll have the, the TJ again, the discussion at the end of the season. Yeah. I but, think you and I are deferring on this. Yeah. Well, he's just scored so many playoff goals that I think he's at seven now in like five games. So, you know, and, it, you know, the, like those are the type of guys that rise anyway. And, yeah. um, like there, so, there's not a ton of off, like offensive forwards that are in the top end of the draft. Like it's basically Celebrini and then like a huge gap and then again less so yep. and i mean i'd be okay we'll talk more about the draft at the end of the season but i'd be okay if the flames take a d with that first pick yeah i i think that it just frankly they need a little bit of everything <laughs> um and they've, they've got the picks to do it right they got nine yeah, picks and that that's where you know like if they ended up with a Ginla or any of the top end uh defensemen that would be perfectly great um it, it's just the better your pick is, the better chance you have to, you know, rebound and actually be a top team. And so, Ottawa's know. got 72 points. Arizona's got 71. Calgary's got 73. Those two teams have played one more game than us. What do you think the likelihood is that either one or both of them jump above Calgary? Well, I don't think that the Flames will move past Seattle in the upward trajectory. Seattle has 77 points. No, so, they're not going to get that many. They're, they're uh, going on a road trip playing three of the worst teams in the league, and we know they play against bad teams. Yeah, like we saw that with Anaheim this week already. Um, honestly, I think that it's kind of a flip of a coin, frankly, whether Montreal, Arizona, or Ottawa can gain enough points to be better than Calgary. I think I one don't of them think, will. Yeah, I don't think Calgary wins more than two games the rest of the way. Um, like, I'd be shocked if they went three and three. Just yeah. based off of the caliber of the opponents that they're facing, like uh, you know, there's three good teams, three bad teams, and you know, the Flames tend to f play down to whatever the bad teams are. So, yep. you know, yeah. it, it's one of those where, uh, you know, like I could see the Flames finishing with 75 or 76 points at the end of the season, and you know, uh, so I mean, we have San Jose, Chicago, the Ducks, and the Blue Jackets who are 
locked in for the bottom four. Montreal's at 70 right above them. Calgary's at 73, and they're at 25 of 32. So, you know, we're definitely, I think, going to finish in the top 10. Oh, yeah, for sure. Or I guess sure. the bottom 10, if you look at it Yeah, top way. 10 pick. Yeah, so and, and like it's currently just a matter of, yeah, yeah, how many they win from here on out. And I'm not in this, let's lose them all, let's tank this. I mean, we've had this discussion, but I just think based on the course of the season, one of these teams at least is going to jump above Calgary. Yeah, like realistically, the Flames are, with the defense that they have, like it's, they're bad. And it's not uh the defenseman's fault they're learning on the fly but we on knew how this to was play. gonna happen right i mean no. oh yeah you and i course. said as soon as hannafin and tanev were gone this team was gonna have a terrible defense yeah and you know you have a bunch of guys learning a new system who haven't played you know top four top six minutes on a regular basis in their nhl career are learning how to play at the nhl level like ohotiuk he looks a little in over his head um Miramanov at times like he'll make the occasional really good play like he did break up a uh, odd man rush the other night but you know the it's one of those where for as good as certain players are playing like they also are prone to making bad errors and you know it's one of those things that you don't know what you got until they actually learn and see if they can tone down the bad plays uh, exactly. Like Mackenzie Weger was renowned for being a giveaway artist where he would literally pass the puck to the guy right in front of the net on the other team and oh, they scored. And, you know, like everybody was like, oh, this guy shouldn't be in the NHL and now he's one of the best defensemen in the NHL. So it, it's one of those where, you know, you just have to be patient with the guys and hope that they learn. And if not, then next year you move on. And. Yeah. So let's go let's go back to the center discussion here. So the Flames, I would say, have two, well, let's call them three natural centers. Nazem Kadri, Michael Backlund, Kevin Rooney. Yeah. Rooney's your number four center. He doesn't slot it any higher than that in this lineup. No. And he shouldn't ever um no. slot higher than number four in the so NHL. Then you've got, so then you've got Backlund and Kadri. Kadri's your number one. Um I don't know that I like Backlund as a number two, but that's where he is right now. They've been playing Sharon Govich at center since Lindholm left. And now they're trying Zari at center. I would keep Zari at center for the rest of the season. What do you have to lose? But yeah. I think it really shows that this team needs to go out either through trade or through free agency. But start of next season, they need a number three C. At a minimum. Or even just a, a like high-end fourth-line center um, that you can shovel in the third-line spot type of thing. But yeah, like realistically, the Flames' biggest weakness organizationally is that they do not have a center that's good um, in terms of up and coming prospects. Like they have plenty of defensemen, uh, both the offensive and defensive style of game. Uh, but the uh, center, like they've got plenty of wingers, but the centers are just. And I mean, really, in every trade bad. they made this year, they brought in D men, um, which they they frankly needed to do. Like they if did, you look yeah. at the the drafts over the last handful of years, other than getting uh, Etienne Morin and uh, Poirier uh, a couple of years ago, like the fl- those were basically the only guys that the Flames used draft picks on as defensemen like it was basically all forwards all the time with a late round pick to a goaltender and you know and while that's been an okay decision like it's created some holes that that thankfully Conroy patched quite expertly this year and hopefully you know um he can continue to address those weaknesses organizationally and I think the three C is a fairly easy position to bring in as a UFA if you want to Oh, for sure. And, you know, like there's plenty of guys that can fit that role. Um, I think like you said, there could be maybe a a 4C, sort of like a Sharon Govich who, you know, got lost in their lineup, comes in and you're going to give him a higher spot. Or maybe a 2C who had a crappy year and is willing to sign somewhere. Maybe you overpay them, but they're willing to sign somewhere to sort of redeem themselves. Yeah, sort of like a Ryan Johansson situation. Yeah. Although not necessarily him. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to overpay by too much. It's your 3C, but, you know, maybe you're paying a million or so more for the, you know, quote-unquote Canada tax. Yeah. 
So I, oh yeah, you know, I, I agree. And realistically, the Flames need a couple of stopgap guys in their lineup uh, just to fill out the lineup uh, into next season. And you know, like you can even you know sell the idea of to potential free agents of hey, you know, we're kind of thin in our lineup. Yeah, play well. We'll trade you at the trade deadline to an elite team. That way you're guaranteed a playoff spot and you can pad your stats from getting a better opportunity here. Yeah, you know. and I'm, I'm not saying you bring Lindholm back, but you find a guy like Lindholm who, I mean, let's be honest, he's he struggled since he went to Vancouver. He could probably use a year or two of sort of a, you know, a, year, a couple of years to redeem himself. Not saying you bring him back, but you find a guy like that and say, you know what, we won't, we're won't. we not even saying we'll trade you the deadline, but come on in here, show people you can do this, show people you can be consistent, and you'll get a bigger deal when we're done with you. Exactly, and, you know, the Flames need to be that, you know, uh, team that's just the bottom barrel team that, hey, veteran guy, here's an opportunity to get better minutes so that way you can be playing on a depth role on a star caliber team later or yeah if you fit really well we'll keep you like that kind of thing and, i mean and, if they and, were looking for a 4c i'd say you could probably find somebody to promote from the wranglers oh i'm uh, sure you could it, but because they're looking for a 3c that's a, a role i think that they're they don't really have no like you could shoehorn zari in and say well hey kid learn at the nhl level how to be a center but um you know, like after his hot start, he's been kind of just okay uh, the second half of the season, which is to be expected um, as the NHL learns to adapt to his game. But, you know, he ne needs to learn how to be a consistent threat game in, game out at the NHL level. And he has, yeah, and, quite and I think every team yet. needs that winger they can, you know, rely on to be a center when they need him or an injury. And I think that's what. Yeah, they're like look Sharon Govich, uh, who's primarily a winger, but you can yeah. throw him in as the center in a pinch, and he's and, played yeah. perfectly well this year at that. I mean, I'm just looking at the uh, the the Flames players that are, that are signed but not rostered for center. Rory Kearns you can't bring up as a 3C. No. Nik Nikolaev's not that 3C. Um, Damiani's not the 3C. If you need a 4C, Ben Jones could probably be your 4C. Yeah, but, and uh, like I could see either Kieran's or uh, the other guy being a fourth center, uh, you know, if need be. But yeah, I, I don't... mean, Kieran's is twenty one. He played mostly in the ECHL last year, so I think you want to keep him down in the Dev system. Oh, I agree. But like, if you absolutely needed somebody, I think you could throw them in the fourth line center spot. But yeah, like it's very thin organizationally. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think they're more likely to do what they did with Dryden Hunt and bring up sort of an older guy. Ben Jones is 25. I think that's the kind of guy that, you know, you might see them look at, um, you know, if you're looking for a 4C. Yeah, I agree. But you're not going to move Rooney up to 3C. No. No, so like, uh, there are limits. You still got the same problem. Yeah. You're so not gonna be. To what, you're not gonna be seeing the uh, random fourth liner on the first line like uh, Daryl used to do. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, really next season, the Flames need to have Sharon Govich and Zari probably both as wingers. And you can't look at either one of them starting at sea. No, and, and it's a good fallback position to have uh, it, and the versatility to have either of mm -hmm. those guys fill in if you can't find an actual center. But, you know... Um, I think that's plan B. If Yeah, also, can. I mean, with nine picks in the draft, they could move a fourth and get that 3C if they wanted to. Yeah, exactly. Like, there are plenty it's of... It's not like, an expensive position to fill. No, and especially you have to figure that other teams are going to be trying to shed some cap, um, you know, looking ahead to free agency, yeah, I mean, et, cetera, et cetera, I could totally see them doing a Kuzmenko-like deal where they're bringing yeah, in or somebody's like, uh, expensive piece. Basically, the Monaghan trade in reverse, where yep. hey, we take your expiring contract that's kind of a dead money that you know the guy can still play at the NHL level, and you know, mm -hmm. we'll eat that for the year, give us a draft pick, and you know, have fun in free, free agent shopping. Because yeah, I, yeah. I know there's a number of teams that want to do that because the cap's not going up that much to 
you know, give like the really cash strap teams uh, much flexibility. No, it sure isn't. Um, the other question I had for you, are you surprised by how much we've seen Markstrom play over the last couple of weeks? Not really. I, I think it's a good way of handling Wolf. And I think that Markstrom's being used as a um, teaching tool for Wolf, actually, in this case, where uh, if Wolf has a good game, Wolf continues to play. If Markstrom plays well, he'll continue to play. But it's basically you win, you play, you lose, you don't. And, um, you know, and it's a good teaching tool for Wolf to be able to you know, know that like if he does have a bad game, that he's not going to be relegated to the bench forever, and that he has to improve if he wants the starter's job. And you know, instead of Markstrom playing like you know two thirds of the games, it's been fairly balanced, which I think is good for both, actually. Yeah, for sure. And you know. I know what you're saying about sort of play the hot guy, and we saw them play Wolf two or three games in a row. I think one thing you have to see from Wolf, if you think he's going to starter, is can he play two or three games in a row? Even if he has a bad game, can he bounce back? And I think they need to try this in the last six games here. Of maybe you play, you know, maybe you start Wolf on two of the three on the road or something. But I think you need to give Wolf. Let's call. I mean, maybe even the last three games of the season. I think you need to give him two or three consecutive starts say even if he was bad can he bounce back because that's what you need from a starter yeah and i think all of this is a very good learning experience for wolf and you know stats be damned he has looked rather well for a rookie goaltender and you know like the team in front of him is just terrible so of course his stats look bad mm -hmm. but you know, um, like he has been full marks for most games this year. Uh, he's only had a couple where he was legitimately bad in. Um, so, you know, I mean, if, if I were the coach, I'd probably be going to Wolf unless he looked really bad for four of the six. Yeah, that's uh, probably what we'll end up seeing. That's the way I would do it as well. They have a they have a back to back. We'll talk about that the when we preview the season. But they have a back to back this week. L A. Anaheim. I'd play him in one of those, and then I'd play him in every other game but the uh, probably the either the Vancouver game or the second um, Sharks game. Yeah, I would probably play Marks from in the last game of the season. I think it's Fan Appreciation Day. The fans are want to see him too. Yeah, especially with it likely being his last game as a Flame. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. and I and I think also I always like the idea when you see a team, you know, twice in a week, give them a different look each time. Yeah, and realistically, frankly, I don't think it matters how many games. Marks from plays where I think it does matter more how many games Wolf plays. I really want to see Wolf in the Edmonton game because I want to see how he handled the um, sort of the, you know, the rivalry and the pressure of the Battle of Alberta as a young goaltender. Yes, and uh, that one, how would you say? I also liked uh, Marks from playing against them because he needs to get over, like, if he is here again next season. Um, he needs to learn how to play well against Edmonton, and I thought he played probably his best game. But, I mean, he hasn't played against... most of the Edmonton games. I think Vladar's played two of the four. Yeah, and I I think that he needs to get over his bad play against the others, and he played rather well in this one. So, you know, we'll see. I, I'm, yeah, I'm not overly concerned. Like, if... Markstrom plays like three or four of the games, then I'd be a little disappointed. But um, I, I don't see and it trending that way. Like you said, I think Markstrom is, this will be his last season as a flame. And I also think you've got to be careful because of it, because you don't want to get him hurt, right? You don't want him to not be tradable at the end of the season. So I think you've got to be careful how much you're playing him. But I think you really need to, you really need to test us and Wolf at this point before you're, <laughs> absolutely sure that you want to move away from Markstrom and to do that, he's got to get play time. So I'd be, I would be disappointed if he doesn't get four of the six Same. or let's say three of the six. He's got to, I think he's got to get half minimum half, but uh, you know, four realistically. Yeah. If, if they're not playing him in half, I mean, you might as well send him back down and bring dance up then. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, you, and, and I think that's the other thing here too, is we know that Wolf's going back down for the Wranglers playoff run here. 
So there might also be some managing of, you know, his time there as well. Yeah, and it depends on when the, the games for uh, the Wranglers actually start and all of that. You might see him getting optioned down before. Yeah, and, and I could totally season. see. I mean, yeah, I don't have those. Good. I think the, the Wranglers pretty much end when the Flames end because um, their season's not over. But I could I could see a scenario where, you know, Dance comes up as a backup for one or two games if they want Markstrom playing at the American League level. Yeah. So actually, the uh, I'm just looking here, Matt. The uh, Wranglers ha- play f- further than the Flames do. So the Calgary yeah, Saturday Flames on the 20th. Yep. Yeah. So the Flames last game is the 18th, and then the Wranglers play the 19th and 20th on the road in Abbotsford. So, um, you know, if they're not going to play Wolf, I maybe you option them. Well, I guess you don't send them down a day early, but I think you'll probably see him not play on the 18th and then play on the 19th. You probably see Markstrom and Net for the Flames in the 18th, and then Wolf the next night in Vancouver, or I guess Abbotsford. So yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how they manage those. Um, and speaking of the Wranglers, the Flames this week were officially eliminated, and the Wranglers have clinched a playoff spot again. So good for them. I mean, there's been a lot of challenges down there. They didn't finish as high as they did last year. There's been a lot of injuries, as we know, a lot of call ups. It was kind of questionable for a while if they were going to make the playoffs, but um, I think you know, good for them for for making it. Good for them for getting getting there with all the adversity, and we'll see how far they can go. Who from the current roster is eligible to go down? Coronado and Wolf. That's it. And Wolf. Okay. So you'll probably see both those guys get sent down then, because there's yeah. I mean, if they can go down, you'll send them down. Mm-hmm. And I think they're going to need that boost because Peltier is already down there. Well, while we're talking about that, question for you then is the Flames have two recalls left to use this season. As you know, there's a limited number of recalls you can use. Wolf is here on an emergency recall because we have no backup goaltender. The league kind of lets you play fast and loose with emergencies this time of year, especially if you're not going to playoffs. But assuming there's two recalls, who do you think the Flames will bring up, if anyone, to take a look at? Uh, Frankly, I don't think that they will. Um, They might bring up one of the defensemen that they acquired. Um, but even then, uh, I, I don't see, uh, any urgency, uh, to bring up anybody. Do you think they'd, they'd take a look at Poirier? Uh, Poirier possibly, uh, um, maybe Grushnikov or, or yeah, whatever. Um, the guy that they got from Dallas, um, and yeah, like that's about it. I, I don't see very much beyond that. I could see them on the defensive side, potentially bringing Kuzmenko or sorry, uh, Kuznetsov or Soloviev up if they want to. I mean, we saw Dennis Gilbert play in the last game and I think almost anyone's better than Gilbert at this point. So I could see them trying one of those guys. I could also see Poirier getting one game. If I was going to use the second recall, I'd probably use it on the other side, though. And if you think about it, Matt, the guy that everyone was really high on at the beginning of the season was Adam Klapka. And he's been yeah. nowhere to be seen. Like, he hasn't been called up. There hasn't been a lot of talk about him. I wonder if you revisit that now at this point and say, okay, you know, what is he at the end of the season? Yeah. Well, I don't think that he's actually earned any... Uh, real chance I guess since. if Walker Dewar stayed on the roster I don't think Klapka's done any worse no it's just yeah how do you say a lot of the young players on the flames are just kind of yeah I mean there there's a lot of AHL development that needs to happen there yeah um the and I think honestly the guy that you'll see is Peltier getting one more look probably you can't bring Sam Morton up because he's on ATO. So I think you'll probably, if I was going to guess, not the way I would probably do, but I'm going to guess Poirier gets a look and Peltier gets a look. I mean, Peltier's already had a look, but I think they'll bring him up for one more. Yeah. And we'll see. Uh, I would expect the last game of the season to be a little bit of a bizarre game in terms of who's in the lineup and who's not. 
Yeah, and the fact that the Wranglers play the next day in Vancouver, it's not like if you're sending these guys down, they've got a long journey to rejoin the team. No, it's not like they have to go to the other side of the country or anything I like mean, that. even if you got to ship them out on their own flight that morning, you can easily bring these, you know, get these guys out there to join the Wranglers. Yep. A um, couple more notes from this week. We talked about the Winnipeg game. Connor Zari was scratched in the Winnipeg game, a healthy scratch. A lot of fans online made a lot of noise about this. What was your thoughts about it? I can understand where Huska's coming from, because Zari has not played all that well in the second half of the season. And, you know, the Flames need to have the young players play. Uh, so, like, I can understand why people are upset, and I can understand where Huska was coming from. And it's kind of one of those where... Uh, Zari needs to play better, and he needs to be a legit top six, top nine player. And for the better half of the second season, like he's been more of a passenger than anything. And you know, um, it's a wake up call. Like just because you were great at the start of the season doesn't mean that you're guaranteed a spot. And you know, he needs to be better if he wants to stay in the NHL. Like, you know, there can't be any complacency in his game. He needs to elevate exactly to the next level. Too, is the Flames need young guys to play, but you don't want to think, oh, I'm a young guy. I'm entitled to a spot in the roster. Because you're not. and you're, you're not. And I agree. He wasn't playing well. I think sending him out for a game or two at this point really isn't going to matter all that much for anybody or, you know, the results of the game. So I think if nothing else, it's showing Zari that we're willing to make that, you know, that choice if you're not playing well. And I mean, he came back and I think he responded well the next game, but I, I totally agree with the coach for doing that. Yep. It's tough, you know, he, but we don't you know, want anyone. We don't want anyone, whether you're Huberto or Zari or Postel or, you know, Dewar to think that you're owed a spot on the roster. No. And your level of play has to dictate your spot in the lineup. And if you're just being a bit of a passenger, you need to get a wake up call to get a boot in the butt to get going again. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, we've seen top players sat out in the last couple of years. We've seen, you know, sometimes it changes them when they come back. I think everyone probably remembers when Johnny Goudreau got sat and, you know, we saw a different player after that. So, yeah, I, I totally think that it's, you know, it's important to send that message and hopefully it's been received. Yep. And then the other uh, story was Postle's third ejection now, third in two months from the Flames. He was out for a whole game there. Um, do you think that he's... I I don't necessarily want to talk about the the league's wheel of justice, but do you think that he needs to find that line? Do you think he's going too far? Uh, he does cross the line, and at times, and it, it's good to at the have same a time though he's being, paid to be that kind of player. That's yeah, who he is. I know, and you look at like Matt Rempe uh, with the New York Rangers, who's basically possible for them. Like, that's the reason they're there, is to be that edgy player. And, you know, it keeps the other teams honest. Like, you can't be skating up the middle of the ice with your head down. Like, you know, you, you're you putting yourself in a bad spot. And, like, I don't think that Pospisil's hit uh, warranted the game misconduct. I, I, I hardly even think it was a penalty, frankly. I think the um, league was trying to tell him we're not going to put up with this. No, and it seemed, well, he did stand up, uh, Morrissey, but, you know, like, it, Morrissey really put himself in a bad position. Like, you do not skate through the center of the ice with your head down and looking down. Like, it, you're going to get hit, and it doesn't matter if it's Pospisil or some other guy, like, that's like hockey 101. You never do that because you're going to get nailed and hurt yourself. And, you know, like that play, I actually kind of blame Morrissey more for it than Pospisil. Because if you replace Pospisil with literally any other Flames forward, they would have hit him in the same manner. Like it's, you know, like you stand up the guy who's the puck carrier and, you know, and... Do you remember a couple of years ago when uh, 
Matthew Kachuk was here and he got a suspension and they did the whole press conference where he pretty much sat behind Trilliving with his head down and it was like daddy coming out and saying he's going to learn where that line is and you know that sort of thing and I think that's maybe where they're at with uh, with Postle right now is you know this is what he's designed to do this is why he's in the league and that's going to happen he's going to get suspended for that but I would rather he's making those hits and getting suspended than not doing that because I don't think he has anywhere near as much value if he's not doing that. No, like so he's that's... not in the NHL if he's not creating havoc. And like that's his game. Like he creates space and time for his line mates because you know, he's out there throwing those hits and being in your face and getting in the goaltender's face and you know just being a disturber like that's his job and uh, you know like you go through all the good teams they usually have one or two of them like Mm -hmm. brad marchand or matthew kachuk or radko gudas like they're all the jacob truba like they're all the same type of guy where you know you have to be paying attention to what you're doing when they're out there like otherwise and i think we have to be okay with you know what he's out of the lineup because he's suspended for a game or two like yeah that's i think part of his job oh for sure and it's unfortunate when other players get hurt and you know you always hate seeing that happen but you know until they remove contact from the game you know you have to be paying attention to what you're doing. And, you know, it's like when Vince Dunn got hurt uh, with Pospisil checking him from behind into the boards, like, that wasn't a good hit, but nobody would have expected Dunn to just basically be staring at the boards five feet away from it for, like, four or five seconds while the puck's coming to him. Like, you would expect the player to turn. And, yep. you know, like... it. It, you can't help when other players put themselves in bad positions. And it just as it's unfortunate that Pospisil's injured the guys or, you know, created bad situations, like, it, it is a two-way street. And, like, it would be just as bad, like, if one of our guys got careless. And, like, I've seen it where, like, the Flames have made suicide passes to their teammates and our guy gets hammered, like uh, Peltier did, um shortly after he came back like uh shillington made a pass to him and he got nailed for it and you know things like that happen and you have to be paying attention and and i wouldn't say that anything the apostle's done is dirty no not overtly where like you know sticking his elbow out or you know um hitting somebody in a very malicious way where like you're guiding the guy from behind into the boards or something like that. It's, you know, it's more situations where you're expecting the player to turn and they don't and bad things happen or, you know, the, the guy plays dumb where he's skating up the middle of the ice with staring at the puck with his head down. Like that's kind of your own fault. Yeah. Like, you know, as much as like, you don't like seeing guys get hurt, you know, the blame is 50 50 there. Like, because, yeah, and I mean, like, you, you, men- you mentioned Rempel. I think Rempel has done some things this year that are questionable. Yeah. I don't know that we can say the same about, um, you know, Postle. Like, I think you'd really have to stretch it, say that he's out there being overtly dirty. No, a, he's not willful. He's not pulling Tom Wilson's where he's willfully trying to injure people or Jacob Truba who goes headhunting waiting to pounce on players who aren't paying attention. It's more situational, and, like, Pospisil's a big boy, and he can throw a hit, so, you know, naturally injuries happen, but it's one of those where, like, how do you say, with Wilson and uh, Truba, like, there is very much intent behind uh, the action, where Pospisil, it's more incidental and... Like him walking that line, and sometimes bad things happen, and yep. and he gets suspended for it. Exactly, but to me, that's his job to walk that line, and we have to be okay with you know losing him for a game or two when he does. No, and like as long Michael as he's not Furland, being overtly dirty. Like Michael Furland and pa- Marty Pospisil are basically the same player, and 
they play that smash mouth in your face type of game and you know it's kind of the point of the player like that's why they're in the nhl and that you know it gives a different look to the the game and you know, it, it's one of those where, you know, I'm sure that there are 31 other teams that would love to have Marty Pospisil on their team. You know, it it's just sucks when that guy's not on your team. <laughs> That's, That's it. You, you, you always hate it when you're playing against that guy, but you love it when they're your guy. Exactly. Like, everybody hates playing against Brad Marchand. But guess what? He's good at it. So... And Boston fans love him. Exactly. And we loved Theron Flurry when he played because he was exactly that same kind of dirtbag. Yeah. Just Andy like McCarthy, Michael, Michael Furlan. Yeah, like that's the, that role. Brian McGratton. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, no, I, I think I think we're on the same page here. Like, this is what's going to keep him in the league. And he's got to know where the line is. I mean, sons, nobody knows where the line is. Well, and, it, and it's one of those things where... It, you know, like, it would be different if, um, like, Pospisil was purposefully headhunting people or, like, crashing into the goaltender with intent to hurt the guy or, you know, malicious slashes like we've seen from Leon Dreisaitl. You know, like, it, it hap you know, those kind of players do exist, and I just, I haven't seen that kind of play from Pospisil. No, yet. me neither. And, and I think that, you know, if he is doing that, the team doesn't want that. And you're going to get, you know, you're not going to be here if you're that kind of player. I think Postle's doing exactly what they need. He's edgy. He's gritty. But he's not, you know, just your dirty, um, you know, sort of enforcer type. No. Well, moving on to another story this week, the, the uh, nominees from each team for the Bill Masterton Memorial Trophy, which is awarded annually by the Professional Hockey Writers Association, the player best exemplifies the qualities of perseverance, sportsmanship, and dedication to ice hockey has been announced. And the Flames nominee for the Masterton is Oliver Shillington. And I would I, not be surprised if... I would actually be, frankly, shocked if Shillington does not win the Masterton this year. When you read those qualities, right, perseverance, dedication, that totally, I think, exemplifies what, what Shillington's gone through. Yeah, like, the man's been through hell, personally. Yeah, and when, and I, look at, when I look at the rest of the guys who have been nominated, I mean, none of them really stand out as an interesting story there, <laughs> excuse me, like Shillington does. No, and Shillington overcame a ton on the personal side of it, too. Mm -hmm reinvigorate himself to be an NHL player and he's played exceptionally well um since he's been back so you know like uh, full marks to him and you know uh, there is no other person on that list of nominees that deserves it more than him no the only thing I'm worried about is I mean I don't know that especially outside of our division that that name is as well known around the league and there's a lot better known names here from some other teams and that's the only reason I'm worried that he might not get it yeah and well, that's possible you know I mean hockey writers know how to write a good story and if you know the story it's a great story but I don't know that the writers in say Columbus know the story or you know Pittsburgh know the story or San Jose I think, you know, we know it in our market and we love it, but I just don't know that it's as well known, you know, in yeah. New Jersey. Oh, for sure. And it, it's just one of those where, like, it, there realistically shouldn't be a better option. No, there shouldn't be. If we look at what, you know, what the award is for, he perfectly exemplifies that this year. Yeah, exactly. So I agree with you. There shouldn't be a question. It should be Shillington's award. Um, and then we've got a question here that I think is a good one, Matt, from our listener, Al. Al's written in a number of times. He said, hey, guys, Ray Fool's edition will be a hard one to follow. Um, and then he has a question. Why did these last few games matter? What do the players need to be doing slash thinking about? And what does the coaching staff need to be doing, looking for? And what does the ownership need to consider? So I'll start with this one. I'm not sure that ownership as, is as concerned right now. I think they know the direction this team is going. But in the last six games, I think the players, especially the young players, are playing to show what they can do, right? I mean, even some of the older players, I think Huberto wants to show that he can still do this. He's looked a lot better in the second half. Kuzmenko, I think, showing he can come back here. I think these guys, 
they're competitive individuals and they need to show that they can do this. Connor Zari, if they keep him at center, show he can play center. Some of the defensemen, like Matt mentioned earlier, you know, can you play top two, top four minutes? Can you turn those things around? I think that there's a lot that these guys are playing for. If not the win, I think personally, each one of them has things they need to develop. I mean, Matt Coronado, right? We've talked about him a lot this year, up and down in the lineup. I think he needs to show he can be an NHLer. I think, you know, the, I could look at any guy on this team and tell you what I think they need to be shown in the, in the next six games. But I think you're taking out the, hey, we're going for the playoffs. Hey, we're going to win. And you're trying to get better and work on something as an individual. And as the coaching staff, I think this also gives them some time to experiment, doing things like putting Zari at center, right? Maybe putting um, Wolf in more games. I think the coaching staff, maybe this is when you want to stick to your system. I think a lot of times guys will go off or you'll change things on the fly because you're trying to win a game. I think now is maybe when, you know, Mark Savard says, this is the power play plan. I want to be seeing this, right? And you're not so much about, oh, we're down by one. Okay, we're going to deviate a little bit to try and, you know, cheat the system maybe and get that one point. I think it's about showing, you know, working on systems, working on getting what you're looking for out of these guys. And and I kind think this is a great time like, to do it. Yeah, kind of sort of like a reverse preseason. Well, I was about to say that. I, almost like the same goals as the preseason. Yeah, like it, they're like, you know, if so-and-so makes a really boneheaded mistake and it causes a goal against, does it matter? No. And it's all about teaching and learning uh for all of the players and you know like frankly a guy like kuzmenko who is trying to re-establish himself as a legitimate offensive threat in the nhl and not just uh one season you know i scored 39 goals and then was never heard from again uh, you know, like he needs to show that, Hey, I, the talent's still there. You just actually have to play me properly. And then, you know, I will produce for you. And, you know, like everybody on the team needs to work on their own individual things. And, you know, well, like and even he, when we say play me properly, what does that mean? I mean, who do we play him with? And I think that's part of what we're trying to find out here. When he first came, he looked really great with Huberdo. He hasn't played with Huberdo last couple of games. So who is his ideal, you know, line matchup? And I think that's one of the things you're trying to figure out too. Yeah. And getting everybody, you know, in positions where they succeed and, you know, finding that chemistry and like with so many of the defensemen being switched out from what was, you know, like it, it takes a lot for this team to, figure out well like do you have a legitimate top four guy in Pahal or Ohotiuk or Miramanov or Shillington or you know and I can just keep going and like the team needs to be able to see based on how they play and play with each other what these guys actually are in the last six games so that way they can basically at their end of season report to each guy you know like work on xyz for training camp and you know send them off so that way they have set goals so that way come september yeah, and, and even before that i think letting management make decisions i mean you know we talked earlier about needing a 3c okay let's say we give zari a center spot for six games management can decide do we need to go acquire one or do we now have one like yeah you know a lot, and a lot like of this if he gonna... smashes it then hey Awesome. Done. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, know, I think a lot of this is also not so much just about what guys should work on, but knowing what you've got there and, you know, who are these guys and what, you know, what do we or don't we have for next season? Exactly. And, you know, like uh, Ohotiuk at times, like he has all the tools in the toolbox. Um, he's big. He's fast. He's got a decent shot, but his decision making is very suspect. And it's like, can you teach that? Um, and can he actually learn and improve the decision making and get more at the NHL level? And if he can, then you know you've got a dynamite four or five guy. Maybe, maybe. But I mean, you can you, know, you can play at the NHL level as a six seven too. Oh yeah, for sure. But you know, it's one of those you don't know where 
he is or what guy he is specifically and you know you need to be able to work with him through the last six and then in the off season to hopefully take those next steps and that's why we got all these young defensemen was so that way you could see mm -hmm. exactly how they are and if they can take those next steps so you can get a legitimate NHL player for as like a throw-in piece instead of uh, needing to spend draft capital and then wait five years. I mean, Matt, there. you've you've talked about your thoughts, and we won't get into it today, but uh, your thoughts about uh, Mongepani maybe not being here next year and what that might look like to move him out. And he's not in the lineup right now. He's hurt. So I think part of that is also, you know, management and coaches looking at, do we have a guy we're comfortable taking his spot in the lineup? And there's a chance to see that. And maybe, you know, I mean, we saw Postel playing with Kuzmenko and Kadri. That's not probably an experiment you make when you're running for the playoffs. So, you know, I, I think it just gives them a chance to experiment. No. Exactly. And Al, and you know, you asked about ownership here, and I kind of dismissed that. I'll go back because I don't want to dismiss that. I think that ownership has already bought into this retool, as as Conroy's calling it. And I have to imagine that this was a discussion that ownership had and have agreed that, yeah, okay, we're willing to go down this road and wait, you know, a year, two years, three years for this to happen. Um, so as far as what ownership needs to do now, I think, is have patience. I don't think yeah, ownership and, needs to say we trust we trust Conroy's plan. Let him see it through. Yeah, and realistically, like the Flames when they were entering their last rebuild, uh, they were patient, um, and it just so happened that they kind of hit some home runs in the draft in fairly quick succession, which changed the script a bit. Because uh, like if the Flames didn't hit the home run on Gaudreau and Monahan and Kachuk. You know, and, like, if one or two of those guys didn't pan out in the way they did, like, the Flames probably would have continued rebuilding for an extra couple of years before turning their sights on being a contending caliber team. And, you know, it, it's one of those situations where, you know, like, if the it warrants it, the team's more than willing to be patient and you know, embrace not being necessarily a good team for a while as long as, you know, you're making the actual proper steps to get back to being a decent team. Yeah, I think ownership right now needs to step aside and let Conroy do his thing, not try to interfere, it would not try to say, you know, you can't trade this guy or can't trade that guy. And I think really what ownership needs to worry about is uh, making sure the new rink is ready, and that's about it. Yeah, and realistically, you know, just based on timelines, like if the it's ready for the 27-28 season, which is where it's trending towards, um, you know, like the flames are going to be bad for two years or three years. And, you know, then they'll be getting like their first round pick from this year should be in the lineup by then their first round pick next year probably will be in the lineup as well. And, you know, as you start to turn things around and you're, you know, and like where Zari and the co are more of the veteran young guys on the team and you're ushering in the next star caliber guys that you draft and, 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 and it, we're just not there yet though. It takes time. We just need to see things through. And Al, you had one more question. We're going to save it for another week. I think it's a better question for maybe our end of season episode. So um, you'll be hearing from Al again in the future because he, he had another good question, but we'll save it. And Matt, that brings us to uh, predictions, a game that's been very frustrating this year. Yeah, well, the Flames have been bizarrely streaky where it's like lose five games, win five games, lose four games, win four games. You know, and until recently where it's lose all the games. <laughs> and yeah, it, it's been a very, you know, very up and down year, which is yep. atypical. Um I don't the week recall of, a team. The week that's... of February 11th was the last week that we lost all the games. Yeah. It's been a weird stretch. So we actually did predictions last week. You didn't hear us do them because we obviously made our predictions for 
way back in 2004. And Matt, I think we were pretty damn close. Um, but we made some predictions here. I predicted that the Flames would beat Anaheim and Edmonton, lose to Winnipeg. You thought that they'd beat Anaheim, lose to uh, Winnipeg and Edmonton. And as we know, they lost all three. Yeah. I was thinking that they'd lose all three. I just didn't want to be a Debbie Downer after how bad they were the week previous. But yeah, uh, that happened. So. <laughs> So um, we've got we've got uh, four, games, four games to look at. Yeah, they've got a road trip. This is really the last road trip of the season. I mean, the Flames have one road game after this in Vancouver, but that's a quick back and forth. So the Flames all week are on the road going down to Southern California, escaping hopefully not another snowfall this week. It seems that's been our, you know, every other week we're getting snow here, but they're going to be in, in brighter um, pastures and they have all late games this week. Good to remember Tuesday. They take on the San Jose Sharks, the worst team in the league. Uh, that's an eight 30 start time Thursday against the LA Kings, another eight 30 start time. And then a back to back Friday in the Honda center against the ducks. And that's an 8 PM start time. And then they're back here Sunday, a 6 PM start time in the Sal dome against the Arizona coyotes. So, Matt, uh, do you want to go first on this one? Well, uh, yeah. Are you just going to go with four losses? No, I'll say that they beat San Jose and then three losses. <laughs> yeah. Wow. They're, okay. They're, they're not a good team. So. And remember, they they get another crack at San Jose in the last game of the season, too. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, My only worry there, like you should beat San Jose, but Calgary should have beat, you know, Chicago last year. They they tend to do terrible against the worst teams. Well, like Columbus, they lost every game against them. Anaheim, they lost last week. Yeah. You know, um, the Chicago, they lost, I think, every game. And yeah, like it, San Jose, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they lost badly, you know, and we'll see. Um, like, the, yeah, yeah. How do you distribute the goaltenders? I probably play Wolf, then Markstrom, then Wolf, and then Wolf again. So you'd have Wolf against uh, the the Sharks. You'd have Markstrom against LA. You'd have Wolf against the Ducks, and then Wolf against the Coyotes. Yes. Yeah, I would. I'd go. I'd go the same. I don't care which one Wolf gets on the back to back, but he's got to get one of them. Um, I think that they're. I think if you want to play Wolf in the back to back and then in in Arizona I'd probably actually go Wolf against uh San Jose, Wolf against LA, then give him a couple days break there, give Markstrom the uh Ducks game and then give Wolf the uh the other game, but I think you'd go either way with it on the back to back, but I agree with you. Wolf's got to get 3 of the 4. Yeah, I'd hope so. I wouldn't be surprised if it was a 2 and 2 either. It's just I would hope that it's 3-1. <laughs> That way they can split the last two next week and call it a day. I'm I'm really torn on how I think this week's going to go because, like, you look at it, and again, it's terrible teams. We should do well, but we do bad against bad teams. Well, and um, it doesn't help that, like, they were literally 3-11 and 11 in their last 14 games, and you got to figure L.A. is going to be really pissed off after losing to them last week. Um so, yeah, it, it's, yeah. All right, I'm going to be more optimistic than you. I'm going to th- say that they lose against the two worst teams. I'm going to say they lose San Jose and Anaheim, and they win against L.A. and Arizona. Yep. Arizona's kind of where we are in the standings. I think that'll, that might be the best matchup of the week. Um. But yeah, I don't know. I can't. I can't be any more optimistic than that, and I fear being any less optimistic than that. Yeah, it's not really fun in this part of the season when you're not actually in the playoffs. Like it's hard to watch and get through them. But thankfully, I mean, the Flames are already on a three-game losing streak. If they have a seven-game losing streak, that's uh, well. Bad. Hey, pick number five. Here we come. <laughs> You know what though? Knowing huh. knowing that if if they get there, they probably end up like moving, you know, moving down. up or yeah. No, they'll probably move down to seven just for. Well, that's kind of what I mean. Yeah, like move. Yeah, move to a higher number. Yeah. Um, j- you know, like yeah, I can just see that being their luck. Yeah, and like it'll be like the sixth and seventh teams to win the lottery. <laughs> just exactly. To, like yeah. you know, salt in the wound. 
Exactly. I can see the. I can totally see it. The Flames stink for the rest of the year. Go, you know, nine undefeated, or sorry, nine without a win. Um, nine games defeated in a row. Get fifth. Get the lottery. Go to seventh or eighth, and it's like we we went through all that pain for nothing. Yeah. Well, but hopefully, regardless, the Flames get a good player in the draft, and we will talk more about the draft when we yeah. get closer. Well, and especially uh, just to preview ahead that uh, because of the fact the Flames have so many picks, um, I will be doing a very in-depth uh, breakdown of the draft uh, like I used to do when the Flames had a ton of draft picks in like four or five years ago. Um, I'll be doing that kind of a thing, especially because the Flames have nine picks um, and a lot to break down. So, you know, plenty of options for this team and... I wouldn't be surprised if we end up getting a few NHLers out of it, but we'll see. We will talk about that when these last six games are over. And as always, go Flames go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.